I now want to turn our attention to the European Convention on Human Rights. This constitutes an international human rights regime. What does this mean? These are the questions that I want to focus on in this part of the lecture. As with our discussion of the Union, I want to talk a little bit uh, about history by means of a general introduction. So, the origins of the Convention can be linked to the growing belief that the protection of human rights against oppressive governments should be embodied in a new world order. And this, of course, this new world order that we are referring to here is something that comes out of the destruction wrought by the Second World War. Now, although there had been international institutions such as the League of Nations that, exi that had existed prior to 1939, prior to the outbreak of the Second World War, the ending of hostilities gave an added impetus to the creation of an international structure in Europe that would allow a just world order in which governmental misconduct would be brought under the control of the international community to come into existence. Fuller consideration of these themes would have to link these concerns about what was happening in Europe with the, uh, what was happening with the United Nations and the promulgation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, because there is, of course, a relationship between the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights. It's a local human rights system, then, a human rights system that applies to Europe. There is, of course, an African human rights system and a Latin American human rights system. Our focus here is, of course, on Europe. So the roots of the European Convention rest in, rather like the roots of the Union, the reconstruction of Europe after the Second World War. Now, the politics of this period are somewhat complicated. And I think it shouldn't be imagined that there was universal support either for the economic community or for human rights. Although certain German and French politicians were certainly keen to achieve measures of European integration, the British position was somewhat peculiar. Britain's forest, foreign minister at that point, Ernest Bevan, supported regional human rights, but he was reluctant to countenance federalism in Europe or closer forms of economic integration. The empire, which still existed at that point, was also an important consideration. Although after the Second World War, there was an acknowledgement that the British Empire would have to be dismantled and independence granted to former colonised territories. The consensus shared by both the Labour uh, Party and the Conservative Party was that this process would have to be gradual. There was a fear in both the Foreign Office and the Colonial Office that human rights were not in Britain's interests as they might act as a spur to independence movements would also bring international scrutiny to bear on what was perceived as a national matter. So there was a reluctance in some ways to um, involve, for, the, for the, uh, the British to involve themselves in the creation of regional human rights institutions, partly because of the empire and the need to dismantle the empire. Nevertheless, in May 1948, delegates from numerous European countries attended the Hague Conference. They resolved, amongst other matters, to propose the drafting of the Convention on Human Rights. The Honorary President, Winston Churchill, who was then in opposition, was a really enthusiastic proponent of a statement of human rights, a point often forgotten uh, on the right in the United Kingdom, who uh, seem of late to have become rather anti-rights. It's uh, worth reminding them that one of their icons, one of their heroes, Winston Churchill, was an enthusiastic proponent of European human rights. The intensely insular legal profession and certain elements of the British government may not have shared Churchill's commitment at that point, but the uh, agenda was seized by supporters of a rights convention. In 1949, the Council of Europe was created and tasked with the creation of the convention. Now, interestingly, and I think this is one of the common problems with human rights, the body was carefully designed to make no significant inroads upon state sovereignty. Indeed, its composition and status reflects, reflects the lack of consensus over the precise form of rights protection in Europe. In some ways, the body at this point was deliberately sidelined. It had no legal, legislative 
or executive status, however, its most important asset was the mere fact of its existence. And as we can see, I think largely the history of human rights is the rise and rise of an idea. Although the uh, Council was initially reluctant about the project of drafting the Convention, it became a major champion of the whole idea of human rights, which began to be seen as a fundamental support for the stability of democracy in Europe. Now, I said a moment ago that, the, uh, that there is a, a fundamental problem with human rights, um, and that is that can be sketched out as follows. Human rights are, of course, international. Uh, if we use the terminology of the Declaration, they are universal. This is obviously somewhat inconvenient for nation states, for the government of nation states, who have always traditionally claimed absolute power over the citizens of that state. So, to the extent to which we have international human rights, or indeed a court of international human rights, that's necessarily going to interfere with the kind of things that, um, the kind of claims that a national government can make. And also, these rights may be inconvenient in relation to what a nation state might want to do. Here's the paradox of human rights then. Human rights has to rely, international human rights have to rely on the nation state to put rights into effect. And yet nation states are often reluctant to countenance human rights because those human rights will necessarily be something of a limitation of the kind of powers they have as national governments. There's a tension between international human rights and the kind of values that are linked to human rights and the whole problem, the whole issue of state sovereignty. And these themes, I think, run through all human rights law. They run through the, the law of the uh, European Convention as much as the Universal Declaration or indeed any other body of human rights. The Convention was ultimately signed in Rome in 1950. Now, I don't want to say too much about the institutional history of the Convention, uh, its institutions, but I do want to point out that in 1950, the so-called Old Convention created uh, a Europe European Commission of Human Rights and a court. The early history of the Convention, after it entered into force in 1953, really sees in the early years the caseload of the court being reasonably light. However, as we continue uh, towards the modern period, we see this caseload increase and increase and increase. By the end of the 1990s then, it was clear that the court and the commission were finding it hard to cope with the ever-increasing number of cases remitted to them. Reform of the convention institutions appeared to be long overdue. Protocol 11, which was ratified in 1998, sought to streamline the, the nature of the uh, convention institutions by um, abolishing the commission and enhancing the powers of the court and the means for enforcing the judgments of the court. The protocol also made it obligatory for states to recognise both the right of individual petition and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. Protocol 14, which was opened for signature in 2004, made for further reforms. It allowed for single judges to hear cases and refined the rules on admissibility of cases to the European Court of Human Rights. Although these measures have made important changes to the convention system, the scale of reform, which was indicated in a report submitted to the Committee of Ministers in 2006, suggests that further measures are necessary. Um, rather like the EU in this sense, one can see the institutions of the Convention as an ongoing experiment, as a kind of work in, in progress. And I think what also lies behind this is that as former Soviet bloc nations became signatories to the Convention, that increased the caseload that was going, that was being remitted to the court. It's worth just stressing here that we do, we are looking at an international human rights system where individual petitions can be submitted to a court and that court can give remedies. If one compares that with other international human rights uh, institutions, other, institu other uh, international human rights systems, one can see that the European system of human rights is characterised by a relatively strong court which recognises individual petition. In other words, I as a citizen or you as a citizen can take a case, send a case to the European Court of Human Rights and that case will award uh, and the court may award remedies. That might distinguish the practice in Europe from other regional human rights systems. Having thought a little bit about the institutions of the Convention and its historical context, 
I want to turn now to the, uh, the status of the convention in British law. It's worth stressing, first of all, that the European Convention is an international treaty. Now, as two of the major commentators on the convention have commented, Hoffman and Rowe, have argued as follows. The convention was an extremely radical innovation. Never before had there been a system of international law which held states accountable to some superior court in respect of actions against its own citizens. Previous international courts and tribunals were constituted solely to settle disputes between states or, in the case of the Nuremberg Tribunal, to try individuals for their own criminal responsibility. I can stress a number of points here. The convention is innovative or radical in that it made sovereign states responsible to an international court. This represents a departure from the previous manner in which international law operated. International law prior to the rise of human rights law was primarily uh, a means for states to resolve disputes with each other. Under the convention, sovereign states must uphold the human rights of their citizens. The radical nature of the convention was stressed with this recognition of the right to individual petition. I've said a lot about in previous lectures about the impact of domesticated rights under the uh, Human Rights Act in British law and the law of the United Kingdom. And I just want to revise these points uh, at this point in our discussion. Prior to the point at which the Human Rights Act domesticated the convention, the convention remained an international treaty. And as I said, the way in which it worked was that a citizen would have to exhaust the domestic remedies available in the United Kingdom and take the United Kingdom as a whole, to, as a nation, to the European Court of Human Rights, arguing that the nation, the United Kingdom, was in breach of its obligations to uphold human rights under the Convention itself. Obviously a very time-consuming and costly process. Once rights are domesticated by the Human Rights Act in 1998, these rights are then possible to use in domestic courts. And we've seen one, uh, I've used one main example uh, of privacy rights where we can see how the uh, uh, access of citizens in domestic courts to Article 8, to privacy rights, have effectively allowed the judges in the common law courts to start developing a domestic law of privacy informed by the principles of human rights. That's a radical change in English law. I haven't got the space within this course of lectures, and indeed it would indeed be a, something you could study as, a, as an option in a, in a law school, for instance, to study human rights law and the growth of the principles of human rights in common law. We clearly can't do that here. What I do want to do is just draw your attention to uh, some fundamental uh, issues in relation to the kind of rights that we find in the Convention. 